Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast and what a special episode this is going to be for you all as we speak to the newest world champion in British swimming, Matt Richards. Yeah, I mean, what a fantastic world champs Matt just had. He was one of, if not the star swimmer on the British team, so it's going to be great to hear his thoughts about his campaign out in Japan and to get an idea of his plans heading into the Paris Olympics as well. Yes, so let's have a quick listen for what is to come on this fascinating podcast. Almost always before we race, we always tell each other, right, safe takeovers. Let's make sure this mm. is safe. And I don't remember any of us saying it before the 4 by one that morning. Um, you know, and I've reflected on that and gone, well... You know, if we'd said that in the call room and just it was the last thing we'd all heard before going out, would we have made that mistake as a team? Who knows? Um, mm. But again, in terms of learning for next year, we'd much rather it happen now than happen in Paris. From my perspective, 144.3 will not win Paris next year. That is, mm. categorically won't win the race. Um, so there's a hell of a lot of work still left to be done, you know, from, from my camp and on my side. And we've got you know, a year now to, to continue the momentum we've got off the back of this season to, to really step it up again. For you right now, you're in kind of a hypercritical looking for improvement phase of your swimming career. Yes, success has come in the form of medals, but at no way do you feel successful, if that makes sense. You don't feel like you, you've peaked. So for you, what would look like success where you don't need this hypercritical eye over every single skill is it the perfect swim is it the perfect performance is it the perfect time what would count for you as that like defining moment in Matt Richards career you know I, I've had those discussions privately I don't think I've ever had that discussion on in a public forum so I don't think Matt Richards needs much of an introduction to everyone on this episode. But in case you aren't aware, he is an Olympic champion from the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games, winning a gold in the 4x2 freestyle relay. Over the year that followed, he experienced some lows in the sport of swimming, but has now bounced back thanks to a move to Millfield and has seen success at the recent World Championships, becoming an individual world champion for the first time in the 200 freestyle, as well as winning gold with that 4x2 freestyle relay yet again. So, please welcome on to this episode, Matt Richards. Matt, thanks for joining us. You said you've had a little two-week break, but very much back to it now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, no, absolutely. Like you said, we're back, back to it now. We've been in the water just over a week at the time of recording. Um, and I actually feel pretty good in the water. Um, already had a couple of little pace sets and things, and feeling pretty spicy already so i'm uh, i'm excited to get at it and see what we can do in the uh, in the short course season now ah uh, yeah there's still very much a long season ahead leading into paris but it's good to hear the the energy is already there like you you barely needed a break whatsoever by the sounds of it yeah no not at all i've always been quite a um highly strung i think it's probably a good word for it um you know i think my parents would always tell you that when i was younger anytime i was out in the water i was just kind of climbing up the walls so i think I've always found it hard to take time out, but I know it's important mentally more mm. than anything just to, to reset and, and get ready for the season ahead. And I've, I've had that now, spent some time with family and um, yeah, I'm just, I'm hungry. I'm ready to go again and I want, want to get back to it. Nice. Is nice. two weeks uh, a long time, would you say? Because for me, I feel like that's quite a, a short break. Yeah, I mean, it's probably quite a short break by sort of general standards in swimming. Um, mm. But for me, it feels like an eternity. You know, by the time I'm at the end of that, I'm I'm just ready to go. I just want to be in the water. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, it, it kind of depends who you ask, I guess. But for me, it's it's probably about right in terms of what I need mentally and what I what I want in terms of wanting to get back in. So, yeah, I think it works well for for me. Mm. So you're not a new guest to the Propulsion Swim Podcast. You've come on before. It was. Well, well over two years ago now during lockdowns and before the Tokyo Olympics so a lot has changed since then you became Olympic champion as part of the relay team and now world champion um can you describe like the last few years what that what that's meant to you because there has been some ups and downs in there yeah there definitely has I mean it's been a it's been very much a roller coaster I know that term gets thrown around a lot but I think the last probably two years for me, it's been exactly that because we've had a real high into quite a big low and then back into a big high again. So it's quite literally like a like a theme park. But um, that's all part of the journey. And I think that's what I love about it. Um, you know, winning gold in Tokyo at, at 18 was was phenomenal. Um, but, you know, at the time I said it was a it was a relay man. Fantastic. But that wasn't all I wanted to achieve in the sport. I wanted to 
go bigger and, and continue to improve. So, um, you know, I think I said in a few interviews after Tokyo that, you know, people said, you've got a gold at 18, you know, where do you go from here? And I was like, well, more than one gold. And I think a few people were probably like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, but, you know, to me, that was always the goal was to start winning multiple medals individually and on mm. relays. Um, and, you know, last year there was a lot of lows last year, but a lot of lessons in that. Um, it was a tough year for me. It was the first sort of struggle I'd had um, in the sport. And I think that taught me so much that I could then take with me into this year. And, and it really fired me up and gave me that hunger to to get after it this season and, and give it everything. Um, and I think having said that, now I'm at a place where, you know, like you said, I won the 200, um, but missed out on the 100, which, you know, yeah. that's not going to that's not going to stop annoying me for a little while yet. So I'm, I'm still really hungry now. <laughs> I, I want to keep going. I want to keep improving. And, um, you know, two golds in, in Japan was fantastic. Now the, the goal's got to be to try and get more than two in, in Paris. Did you feel like you had to go down into the down year to be able to come out the other side, if that makes sense? See, I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. I don't think I necessarily needed it last year to do well this year. But I do think I needed to have it at some point early on in my career to be able to continue to improve and to progress as I get older. And, you know, I don't plan on going anywhere anytime soon. I'm, I'm still young. I'm 20 years old at the moment. You know, I'm, I'm planning on being in the sport a hell of a long time just yet. And at some point, the lessons I learned last year were going to be needed. Um, and so I'd much rather uh, learn them early on than have to wait until I'm 25, 26, 27 and then get to that point and be like, oh, maybe it's just my time. Maybe it's time to to call it a day you know now I know when I get in those positions how I need to to respond and improve what were those lessons you learned then because you made that move after your year at Bath to then transition over to Millfield School and that's <laughs> reaped all the success that kind of everyone knows about now but what were the lessons that you learned that caused that move if that makes sense yeah I mean I think there were all sorts of lessons but you know some of the key takeaways for me were to to follow your heart and to to sometimes learn when to not listen to other people's opinions um, because everybody has opinions and sometimes that's perfect and it's fantastic and it's what you need. And there are other times when you just need to learn which ones to, to select, if that makes sense. Um, mm. You know, and there were a lot of opinions when I made the decision to move down here and lots of people didn't think it was going to work. Lots of people didn't think it was the right thing. Um, and, you know, it might not have been for them, but for me it was. Um, you know, I knew that from speaking with the team down here, I knew it was going to work. Uh, and that's why I made the decision ultimately. So, that was a key takeaway. Um, also, learning how to how to sort of open up a little bit and talk with the the support system I have around me about what's going on and and you know when I'm struggling in the sport, learn to be open about that and you know speak to Emily about it, speak to my mum and dad about it, speak to my coach about it, and be you know just open and honest about this isn't working for me right now. I don't know what it is, but I need some help in figuring out where I'm going wrong here. So. There were lots, lots and lots of key takeaways for me, but um, I won't bore you with them because I could probably speak about them for all hour. But um, <laughs> yeah, those are probably the, the main two. Mm. So do you think going through that down year has made this year's success even sweeter? Uh, yes and no. Um, you know, I think there's, there's never any, what, what's the phrase? There's no... Uh, no rainbows without rain or something like that. I don't know. It could be, I could have completely made that up. I don't, I'm not I, too sure. I like but it if it's new. I like we'll it. We'll coin it new. as mine. We'll call it mine. Uh, anyway. Market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, so, I mean, I think, like you say, you can't, you can't have the highs without the lows sometimes. Um, but I think this year was always a stepping stone. It was always just a, a build. Essentially, we wanted to make sure that by the end of this year, I was back on the trajectory that I wanted to be on finishing in Tokyo. Um, so that we could then build into Paris. And that, that was always the plan this year. And I think we've definitely executed that. There's still lots to improve on from this year and lots of things that I didn't do very well this year uh, that we can continue to pr improve on next year. But I think we're, we're definitely in a, a much better position right now than we were 12 months ago. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you come away from these world champs with two gold medals, but you have kind of already touched upon one of those races sticks with you as a little bit of a disappointment the individual 100 and then there's the four by one relay as well so on the surface it looks like a very very successful meet but for you do you think there's still some stones that were left unturned oh massively massively yeah i think you know it still frustrates me i've, I've watched back the 100 free final a million times i think me and Jacob Whittle were sharing a room together out at, uh, out at Worlds. And I think the two of us watched back that relay takeover between the two of us about a million times while we were there. And I think mm. 
you know, both of those two two races just it was one of those things where they just didn't go to plan. Um, you know, I'll start with the hundred for me individually. It was a, it was a great race. It was a PB again. You know, the third PB I had in what thirty six hours. Um, you know, and on the surface you look at that and you go, well, that's fantastic. That's great. You know, you can't can't ask for more. But then when you watch back the race and look at the number of technical errors I made and tactical errors that I made. Um, and there's, we've got a screenshot of five meters out from the wall, uh, from the, the analyst's camera back in the stands, uh, about five meters out from the wall. My head is pretty much in line with Chalmers, maybe 10, five, 10 centimeters behind him. And you look at that and go, well, if he went 47, one to win it, and I was there at five meters out, how did I end up coming fifth? Um, you know, and there's a lot to learn from that. And we know now going forwards, there's some work to be done on my finishes. Um, you know, and th- that's what it's all about is about learning. But I think, you know, like you said, that four by one, that hurt us, that hurt all of us. You know, I think I've said it already, but you know, we, we win as a team and we lose as a team. It is a team effort. Um, you know, Jacob was on the blocks, but I was coming into the wall. It could have been either of us that were at fault there. Um, and likewise as a wider team, I think almost always before we race, we always tell each other, right, safe takeovers. Let's make sure this is safe. And I don't remember any of us saying it before the four by one that morning. Um, you know, and I've reflected on that and gone, well, you know, if we'd said that in the call room and just, it was the last thing we'd all heard before going out, would we have made that mistake as a team? Who knows? Um, Mm. but again, in terms of learning for next year, we'd much rather it happen now than happen in Paris. Mm. Well, how, how did you deal with that disappointment? Because it was re- it was literally the very first race for a lot of you guys. So, how did you deal with that disappointment right at the beginning of the week? Um, I think it was a a real a really interesting one because um, I think in those situations, as a team, you end up either falling apart or coming together. Um, and I think all of us involved in that relay and the wider team as a whole did a fantastic job of like gelling together and and using that as fuel for the rest of the week. Um, you know, nobody was pointing fingers. Nobody was trying to palm the blame off on each other. It was just, this has happened. We can learn from this. We'll go back at the end of this week and we'll figure out what happened and why and make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, but you know, I think from my personal perspective, I was like, well, that's really annoying. I have no doubt we could have won that in that final. Um, you know, and I was like, I went 46, eight in the morning, Mm. first race of the meet, no caffeine, no bicarb, nothing, just, you know, first swim. And I was like, well, I'm on great form. I wonder what I would have gone in the evening. Um, but I was like, I've also then got seven days of racing still to go um, and some big goals for what I want to do in those seven days. So now is not the time to dwell on what's been and gone. It's time to prepare for what's coming. Yeah. Am I right in thinking you want to go to Doha, make it right, and then, well, qualify for the Olympics? Because this is a big Olympic gold chance now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, we've not actually had the discussions just yet. I'm sure the next month or so is probably where we'll have lots of discussions at length about what the plan is around that. Um, you know, I don't really know if I'm allowed to be speaking about it just yet. But personally, my my opinion on it is that I'd like to go. I'd like to be there and, and be part of that team to make sure. Um, you know, I know there's been a few options banded around so far. But from my opinion, I'm like, I, I want to make sure we're, we're there. We get the spot. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that means that I need to go to Doha, even if that means fly in the night before and fly out the evening after the race, so be it. You know, I'm, I'm happy to turn up, get it done and, and get out of there and carry on prepping for trials. But it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really complex decision that's got to be made down. I, I don't know. don't know the answer just yet. So it's going to be an interesting one. Mm. I think if it's a, a gold medal, Olymp- Olympic gold medal winning opportunity, I think you kind of have to do it. It's, it's kind of bite the bullet and you do have to go. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, we as- we assume you're going to go, but I was we were talking on the podcast whether you do what you say, where you fly in the night before, do the race, and you fly out immediately, or do you turn it into a, an actual competition? You stay there for the week or so, but it's, uh, you obviously can't say too much, I guess. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's such a it's such a complex one because it is right in the prep for trials, which is obviously then the prep for mm. for Olympics. So it's a it's a weird time for it to fall, and it wasn't in the plan for any of us to be there, but. Um, you know, that, that relay has to be qualified for Paris because, like you said, it, it's a massive gold medal chance. There is absolutely no way we don't make sure that that, that team qualifies. Um, mm. But how we go about doing that, I, I don't know yet. I'm not I'm not too sure. Uh, that's mm. what the uh, the coaches and selectors are paid for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so leading into the big one, the 200 metres freestyle, there were... It's kind of weird to say that the you two Brits weren't 
the heavy, heavy favourites. Given that Britain's had such history in the event in the event over recent years, you and Tom swam, I think, the fastest two times in the world at trials at that point in time, and yet eyes were elsewhere on Popovich. Did that help leading into that final at all? Yeah, I think it's a it's an interesting one. I think off the back of trials, um, I've tried really hard going into worlds to kind of figure out how to ignore the the expectations whether that be expectation on me or expectation on somebody else you know mm. I, I think um i'd made the mistake leading into trials a few times of of looking through comments on posts um and and things like swim swam comments and stuff stuff like that and i think that's a it's a trap you can fall into as an athlete uh, and i don't oh, yeah. think it's a positive one i, I don't think it's ever going to be a positive one i think i've learned from that going into trials um because in some ways, going into trials, I was like, well, I want to make sure I prove everyone wrong. Everyone who's doubting me, I want to prove them wrong. But then you end up being distracted from what you're there to do. You're not there to prove people wrong. You're there to execute a really well race to swim. Um, and I think going into Worlds, I tried really hard to not know what people are expecting. So I, I didn't really know if people were expecting me to be anywhere near a podium. People were expecting me to win it. People were expecting me not to make a final. I, I had no idea. And, and okay. likewise... I would assume people were expecting Popovici to win. Makes mm -hmm. sense. He's the reigning world champ and third fastest ever. So I, I would understand why people would assume that. But from my perspective, I was like, everybody is in here to race. We all have a chance of winning it because we're in the race. Um, and so I couldn't really care less who people are expecting to win. I'm going to go in there and execute my race. I like that. It's um, Do you know what? In the world of social media, swimming is well behind the curve. Like, miles behind the curve of other sports and what's going on in those and like we're trying to get it to that level but then you actually look at how other athletes in other sports take on social media especially around big events and like famously in my mind is lebron james when it's playoff time he just puts one post up playoff james and then he's blank for the whole thing he's off his phone which seems very very simple like why aren't more people doing this but actually it's like social media and swimming on Instagram swim time is it just exploding and as a swimmer it's very easy to get drawn into that so maybe the lessons from other sports and actually taking it off did you take the apps off your phone at all like leading into worlds and stuff like that it's maybe something that should be looked at going into Paris because I don't know distractions is never a good thing yeah I mean so I personally didn't I know that some people do and I know some people like to um, personally, I think we spend so much time at meets like that and in the holding camps with far too much time on our hands that I'm mm. like, if I haven't got something to scroll through or flick through on Instagram <laughs> or TikTok, mm. I think I'm just going to go nuts. Um, and it's probably, it's probably not Fair a good enough. thing. Um, but you know, being that swimming is, is all I have, you know, it's my, my profession. I don't do another job on the side. I'm not in education anymore when I'm at meets like that and things like that, where all I'm there to do is swim, you know, I'm, I'm not there to go for a coffee with Emily or, you know, go and see my mm. parents for a weekend. You, there's, the, you're really limited on what you can do. So I personally don't. But what I did try and make sure I did was while I was racing, stay off looking through messages. Um, don't be going on Instagram and looking through, you know, posts and mm. who's tagged me and what. Um, you know, I think after a few races, I'd go on, I'd just repost a few stories from the mentions bit on Instagram. I'd just repost a few because I was like from a commercial perspective it's probably good to be putting something out um but this, this is where you need a brand manager yeah someone to take it. but the swimming's just not at that stage is it exactly yeah exactly so it's um it's an interesting one i think it will probably continue to evolve as as the sport hopefully continues to get bigger um mm. but it's a, a another one that i think we're all trying to figure out as we go along really yeah yeah should, mm. should we talk about the race itself then yeah dan just palm that off on me. Oh, right. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah. Well, I, I want to ask you about your your tactics. Uh, would you say that you you went, went into the race with the perfect game plan? Because I, I said I remember saying in the preview of our podcast leading up to Worlds that to be able to beat Popovich, you really kind of have to attack him at the very beginning because of of the back end speed that he had, that he possesses. But that didn't seem to happen for him uh, for this meet for for whatever reason that is. Um, was that always your game plan to be able to? actually outdo him on the last 50 yeah so it's a, it's a really interesting one the tactics going into that 203 were very different to how the race actually ended up panning out um mm -hmm. so going into the race my expectation being in lane two with some in lane three david in lane four 
Uh, I think Luke Hobson in lane five and Dino in lane six. Um, I was looking at that and thinking, right, so the guys either side of me, I've got Sunwoo on one side, Kieran Smith on the other. I was like, what I need to do here is get on the guy who's going to be the fastest out, which is, you know, historically been Sunwoo. He's been out in 49s Mm -hmm. to feet at 100. So I was looking at that and, and myself and Ryan were going, right, well, he's going to be out quick. He's probably going to be out. 50 point very low maybe a 49 um so we were looking at that and going okay if he's going to be out like that in the lane next to david he's not going to be on david's lane rope he's probably going to move to my lane rope to stop david getting a wave which means there's a perfect chance for me there to jump on somewhere's wave for the first hundred and just get dragged out to 100 meters so i was thinking this is fantastic i've got a great lane draw here um we got into the race and what actually ended up happening was david was the one who went out really fast uh, some we moved across and got on David's wave, um, which meant that I was kind of stuck in kind of no man's land. Kieran had moved to the opposite side from me, so the two of us didn't have to worry about each other. Um, and some we was also the opposite side from me, so I was just kind of sat in the lane in the middle going, well, this wasn't what I expected to happen, <laughs> but I think the plan's just got to be exactly the same now, but just without the wave. So then the plan was just sit for 100 metres as smooth as possible, as easy as I can. Mm. Um, but make sure I'm in the race, you know, keep, keep with the pack, if you like. Um, David was out really fast. He was out really, really mm-hmm. quick. I think he was a 116 something at 150. Um, and that's mm-hmm. quick. That's really quick. I was out 17, seven ish. I think I was something like that, which is also a really fast 150 split. Um, but made to look like child's play compared to how fast David had gone out. Um, and I'd be lying to you if I said coming off that last wall, underwater seeing David well over a body length ahead I'd be lying to you if I said at that point I was like oh I've got this one um you know at that point I was like right I need to go here and like I really need Mm. to make a move because if he's that far ahead now I need to be long gone right now because (laughs) otherwise I'm not winning this race um Mm. and so coming down that last 50 it was all just all that was going through my head was just trying to stay long stay smooth, not get choppy and short and aggressive and, and tr- you know, fighting the water. Um, but also just trying to dig, dig in and dig deep and, and, you know, not, not be distracted by pain, not be distracted by what anybody else is doing and just crack on down that last 50. So when I hit the wall, um, I knew that I'd beaten some woo in the lane next to me because I could see my hand touch the wall before him. Beyond that was just a sea of white water and splash and wash. I didn't know who else had done what, you know. So I didn't know whether I'd gone 143 or whether I'd gone 146 or the other guys had just had crazy races and gone 142s or whether they'd gone 146. I was like, I have no idea where I've come here, but I know I've beaten some woo, so I haven't come last. Um, so I then <laughs> I turned around to look at the scoreboard um, and looked at the scoreboard and it had what looked to me like either a one or a seven by my name. And I was like, right, hold on a minute. Let me just double check. Yeah, that's first. Okay, yeah, we'll take that. That's good. That's very nice. (laughs) So going into the race then, you were obviously hoping for an early early leader. Uh, Is that always the aim for, let's say, the elite swimmers to try and get on someone's wave? So it's almost a disadvantage if you do take it out quite quickly? Um, It's definitely something we're all aware of. Um, It's definitely something we're all all going to sort of take into account and think about. you know, I think from my perspective, I know certain people are going to be out fast. I know other people are probably going to try and get on my wave. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think anybody at the highest level of the sport knows that if somebody in the lane next to them is going to be out quick, you'd be mad not to use that to your advantage uh, because it is just, it is just like a a free aid whilst you're racing and it makes life so much easier. Um, So if you've got the opportunity to use it, then use it. Um, But I think there's also, um, there's also a time and a place for it. There are some times where if you want to get out fast and you want to throw down a big time and a big marker, you can't do that by sitting on somebody's wave. There are times when you're just going to have to get out fast, be aggressive and just, and just hold on. And I think, you know, I, I, I feel for David because I know that was what he was trying to do. He was looking at that race and going, right, well, I want to make sure I batter these guys. If I'm going 142, I don't expect any of these guys right now to go 142. So I need to be out way quicker than them and hold on. And I'm sure that was what he was thinking. Um, you know, and I, I, I do admire that. I understand what was going through his head and I feel for him that it didn't go his way in that race. Um, but I'm sure that won't be the last we see from him being extremely quick on a 2-3. And, you know, from my perspective, 144-3 will not win Paris next year. That is, mm-hmm. categorically won't win the race. Um, 
so there's a hell of a lot of work still left to be done you know from from my camp and on my side and we've got you know a year now to to continue the momentum we've got off the back of this season to to really step it up again do you think the fact that you're racing like there's so much of that chat then about the race came into tactics and came about like race sharpness and race strategy do you think the fact that you are racing world class 200 freeze almost week in week out when it is raced in this country helps you in terms of the preparedness for that meet because Popovich had, like essentially was a little bit cold going into like no one knew what time he was capable of going into that meet whereas you and Dino had to really swim out of your skin to make the team do you think that is like a big benefit to you guys going into those major meets 100 percent, 100 percent. I think the depth we've got in men's freestyle in Britain right now is you know probably probably the best in the world um i'd mm. say i think you know even the americans would be hard pressed to argue that they've got a better men's freestyle setup than us right now likewise the aussies would would be hard pressed to say it um and i, I mean that on both the 100 and the 200 free we, we've got some unbelievably good talent in those events um and a hell of a lot of, you know extremely long list of people that mm. maybe aren't right now making the individuals but that are just behind that throwing down some crazy times. We've got some young talent, we've got some more experienced guys and everything in between. And I think, um, like you say, the benefit of that is that when it goes into a big meet, um, you know what you're capable of, you know what the other British lads are capable of. But then also when it comes to a relay, you know, we've got an exceptionally good group of lads that are going to be racing that. I suppose a comparison would be the Australian women's team for the 4 by one because it's nigh on impossible to go on that Australian team for the 100 free for the women right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Shayna Jack was throwing down ridiculous splits and she didn't even make the individual itself. So surely it must be the same thing over here for the 200 free for the men. Yeah. Oh, 100%. I think, like you say, Shayna Jack in, in the Aussie women's side of things is you know, almost really unlucky to be Australian in the sense that she never, <laughs> you know, she never got to swim an individual at Worlds. But you know, obviously then got to do some unbelievable things in the relays. But I think you could say the same in Britain right now. We've got the likes of Duncan and Jimmy, who this year weren't swimming the individual 200. But, you know, both of those guys are individual gold, silver, bronze medalists at, you know, the, the largest meets in the world multiple times. So, um, you know, I think it's a very similar thing over here. But what that does mean is that we get some extremely fast and very sort of high octane races at, at British Champs. And, um, you know, I think that's that's fantastic for the next generation then to be able to see extremely high level racing on those events on home turf. You know, it's accessible for people to see and to be able to watch. And I do think that plays a part in inspiring the next crop to come through and, and continue to carry that torch. Yeah, absolutely. I think we spoke to like several swimmers in post trials and no matter what their best event was, all of them were like, well, I've got to swim the two free because you know there's a chance of getting on that relay team so i've got to got to do well at that event um should we talk about the one free then because to start with you mentioned him duncan scott you actually only got the spot to swim at worlds because he pulled out of that event and then you go on from there to set three british records in three swims so you've said it's a disappointment in the fact that you came fifth but actually as an audience and as swimming fanatics everyone will always say okay pb is the best you can ask for going through three pbs three rounds an exceptional quality swim yes there's the nitpicking of gotta do a better finish but actually why is it important for our younger listeners to go through those rounds and swim faster and pbs why is that a good thing yeah so i think this is almost like a multi-layered thing so from a from a why is it important to continue to improve across the rounds i think that is one of the fundamentals of sport um in the kind of sport we do anyway similar to athletics and things like that where you've got heats finals sometimes heat semis and finals um it's really important that you have faster finals as people say faster finals that's always the, the term that's sort of used for that um the reason for that is because the race isn't going to be won in the heats the race isn't going to be won in the semis. You're only going to get the medal from doing it in the final. Um, so if I look back at champs for me this year on the 100, like we were just saying, um, my time in the heats was great. 47-7, really good. Felt smooth, felt easy. And then get into the final, go 48-0 and come third. That's not good enough. 
Um, you know, that doesn't get a spot on the team. Thankfully, Duncan had the 2am the same day and chose to, to not swim the 100, which meant that I did get to swim it. Um, but that, that was by more luck than judgment on my part. Um, you know, and so looking at that in terms of where can I continue to improve and the lessons I and you know, younger swimmers, as you say, can take from that is those swims needed to be swapped around. Um, a 48-0 in the heats would have easily got me into the final at Champs. I think it would have got me lane four. Um, and then a 47-7 in the final would have won it. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you progress throughout the rounds and there's a skill to it. There's a there's an art to it. And, you know, I haven't by any means got close to perfecting that yet. Um, you know, and I, I don't know if I ever will get close to perfecting it, to be honest with you, but I'd like to try and get as close as possible. Um, you know, and I think that's, it only gets done with experience. You only... Mm only improve those skills by doing it and, and doing it in different events, doing it at different meets, doing it against different people, swimming it different ways. Um, and I think if you do all of those things and continue to do all those things whilst trying to learn from each one, eventually you're going to get to a point where you know how to do it pretty much time and time again without fail. You said that the, the last five metres were the thing that you needed to work on the most. So you've obviously looked back at the race and had a bit of feedback with yourself and your, your coach. Um, what area of those five metres is the thing that you need to work on the most? Is it literally your head's too high or, I don't know, your, your stroke rate's not quick enough or something? What What is it? Yeah, so that, that 100 freestyle, it was more than just the last five. Um, the last five is where I, is where I lost the podium. Um, the last 25 is where I lost my shot of winning it. Um, so with about 25 meters to go, uh, I saw Kyle in the lane next to me in lane five, uh, coming back at me like an absolute train as he does. Uh, I think he was out in a, in a three zero. I was out in a two seven, I believe. Um, and so I was out a little bit ahead of him. Uh, and with about 25 meters to go, I'd gone from having a little bit of room with him to having him pull up alongside me. Um, and that was the point where in my head I was like, right. I need similar to the 200 free. I was like, I need to go here. I need to stay long. I need to stay, you know, controlled and relaxed, but kick hard. Uh, forget about any pain, forget about any distractions, just go. Um, and I tried to do that on the hundred, but almost went a gear too high. If I was in fifth gear and I needed to go up to sixth, I kind of went to seventh and just kind of just started flailing around and kicking hard and swinging my arms rather than, you know, keeping that control and that composure which again is really useful for me to learn. It's a similar sort of mistake to what I made in the 100 final at Champs, but where I did it at Champs, I did it on the first 50, and at Worlds, I did it on the second 50. Uh, so eventually, I'll figure it out. <laughs> I'm still in the process. <laughs> um, but I think you know that was where I lost the chance of beating Kyle and, and taking the win on that was I kind of lost my composure and lost my control in that last 25 when he kept his, and that allowed him to pull past me. Uh, with about five meters to go, I just didn't spot the finish well. Um, you know, I, I sort of looked up. I had a little look up because I have quite a low head position. I had a kind of little look to see where the wall was um, and just didn't spot it well at all. So I kind of, I hit the wall kind of on a stroke like this where my, I've still got kind of a bend in my arm. There's no reach. There's no, no nothing. I was just kind of like smacked the wall, really. There was no mm. technique or, or finesse to that finish at all. It was a really sort of brute like finish um which isn't what you want on a on a swimming race um but you know i think that's something i've really been working on this year is spotting walls um after the short course season we we analyzed how i performed there and we were like the the big issue for me right now is my approach into the walls that's where i'm losing a massive amount of time on turns and finishes um i think on the turns we're getting to a place now where they, they're really consistently solid Still not where we want them to be, but they're solid. Um, the finishes, I, I still need to continue working on. We need to figure out what works best for me. Um, I think for pretty much all of Worlds, I was kind of finishing like this. Um, I'm pretty flat with the head down, whereas I, I can, you know, if you rotate, the amount of extra reach you'll get in there is 20 centimetres. And, you know, I don't need to tell you guys how big of a difference 20 centimetres mm. can make on 100 free. So, um yeah, there's lots and lots and lots of things that we can continue to improve on. Um, and that's exactly what we now plan on doing going into Paris. So is it a case of breaking the habit then? Is that the way you practice finishes? Just a case of repetition, repetition after every, let's say, every set that you do? Yes, I think there's there's multiple ways we can do it. I think the initial thing has got to be figure out what is the fastest way for me to get my hand to the wall. So put the timing pads in and just figure out <clears throat> at a fast speed, 200 pace, 100 pace, 50 pace, 
what is the fastest way I can get my hand onto the wall. Uh, once we know the, the fastest technique for me to do it, then it's, you know, like you say, repetition, practice it, continue to do that over and over and over again to sort of break the habit. Uh, and then the last thing is then doing it under fatigue. So that's when we then need to be focusing on it on the really hard sets when I'm hurting and I'm, and I'm struggling and make sure that every single rep, the finish is, is as close to perfect as we can get. Mm. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Talking lots. Sorry. <laughs> can I, from what I've taken away from the, the 40 minutes we've talked through right now is that like for you right now, you're in kind of a hypercritical looking for improvement phase of your swimming career. Yes, success has come in the form of medals, but at no way do you feel successful, if that makes sense. You don't feel like you, you've peaked. So for you, what would look like success where you don't need this hypercritical eye over every single skill? Is it the perfect swim? Is it the perfect performance? Is it the perfect time? What would count for you as that like defining moment in Matt for Richard's career where you can sit back and be like happy? And I'm not saying you're not happy now in any way. I'm just <laughs> yeah. in, in a way that like you can sit back and go perfect. What what looks like perfect and sort for of be, you? Be content. Do you mean? Yeah, a little yeah. bit. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't think I've ever it's, been asked that. It's a that tough one. Publicly, I, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I've had those discussions privately. I don't think I've ever had that discussion on, in a public forum. Um, it's a really interesting question, and I, I don't know if I know the answer just yet. Uh, I do think a large part of what has made my success so far happen is by the fact that I'm never satisfied with the successes I've had. Yeah, I wasn't saying um, it was a bad thing at all. Right? I, yeah, no, I see it as a good thing right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um, in answer to your question, I, I think the the day where I will sit back and be content and happy and, and pleased with everything I've done will be the day I retire. Um, between now and then, I will constantly be looking for improvement. Um, that's not to say that I won't be happy with the, mm. the things I achieve as I go along. You know, I'm, I'm over the moon with the results at Worlds. Um, mm. To win my first individual title is fantastic. I was absolutely over the moon with that and, and forever will be. Um, likewise, to win gold in Tokyo and then win it again on the 4x2 in, in Fukuoka, those things are, I will never, ever not be over the moon and, and pleased and happy with those results. Um, but that doesn't mean those results couldn't be better. Um, mm. You know, the... The 200 was fantastic. It could have been faster. Uh, the 4 by 2 in Tokyo was fantastic. But if I'd gone a couple of hundreds faster, we'd have got a world record. The 4 by 2 in Fukuoka was fantastic. But again, if I'd gone a little bit faster, we might have got a world record. Um, and so when you look at it like that, I think that's where sort of longer term success comes in. Um, because I do think a lot of people get to a point in their careers where they, they achieve what they feel was always their their goal and their dream and, and their ceiling, if you like. Um, once they hit that point, I think a lot of people find it really hard to continue improving and to continue PBing and progressing and dropping times. Um, and I think for some reason we get sucked into this mindset in, in sport of once you get to the very highest levels, you can't continue to take off massive improvements and take off big chunks from what you've already done. And I, I don't really know why that is. I don't know why that mindset is is just the sort of accepted way of thinking about it. But for me, I'm like, you know, that I'm I'm in no different of a position right now to where I was 12 months ago in terms of the, the improvements I want to make. You know, when you break down the swims and look at where I'm losing time, it's black and white. It's a very simple sport. It is all just numbers. Um, when you break it down and you look at the numbers, there are significant portions of my races where we can take off significant time to continue improving. Um, and so, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, I'm not looking to take off 0 0.1, 0 0.2 from my PBs. I'm looking to take off big chunks again. Um, and that's not to say if I don't take off big chunks, I won't be pleased and happy with the races. Um, but again, I think it comes back to, I will still be hungry. By the time I finish those races, I'm still going to want more. Yeah, it, yeah. I, I guess that question was more to try and find out what the drive is inside you. And I, I think the constant improvement and constant need to better yourself is certainly one reason to succeed in the sport of swimming, I would say. Well, it's kind of dangerous in a way because then you'll never be satisfied. Like you're Olympic champion and yet 
not quite satisfied. You're world champion, but not quite satisfied. Like, where where is the <laughs> the limit for it? You know, I mean, it's different. It's a, it's it's yeah. It's good that you're talking about it. I think that's quite key. Yeah. Obviously, not doing it publicly like now, but doing it quite regularly in, with your team in Milford. I think that's quite key. But um, yeah, striving for perfection is hard. <laughs> it's, yeah. not, it's not easy to be perfect. No, absolutely. And, and I'll never get to perfection. Um, mm. Don't get me wrong. I'm never expecting, you know, if I can get to the point in my career where I can retire and say I've had the perfect races, you know, I, I think someone needs to slap me across the face because it's just not <laughs> possible. It doesn't happen. Mm. You, you, there's never going to be a perfect race for anybody. Um, you know, I think if you look at every world record that's ever been set in swimming and probably in all other sports and ask the people that set those world records, was that the perfect race? Was there anything you could have improved on mm. leading up to it or in the race? Um, I would be willing to bet your money if they really reflected on it. Every single one of them would say, no, it wasn't perfect. It was really mm. close to perfect, but it wasn't perfect. Mm. And that's the kind of mindset I look at it with. I'm like, I want to try and get as close as I can to perfect. And then no matter how close I get, I'm going to try and get closer next time. I guess that's that's kind of the oh, big philosophical, but that's what makes what makes sport great, isn't it, really? That you, yeah, everything can always yeah. look better. Um, let's, let's move on then to the final race, the 4 by 2 We've touched upon it a little bit. The outcome it looked on the face value was that gold wasn't enough. So is it gone of the days that big celebrations for a world title is there for the gb team like is the standard that you expect is that the standard that you guys expect now like gold at a world stage is that bare minimum that's a really hard one um you know i think i can only speak for myself um you know i, I couldn't speak for the team as a whole but you know i think we're, we we want to do something special on those relays um we've got the people to do it we've got mm. The talent we've got the ability we've got we've got the results to be able to get those things done um it's now all about every single one of us executing on the day so mm. what needs to happen for those world records to be broken is four people that we have to go really really fast on their individuals within the relay um mm. and that is fundamentally the key to a fast relay it's just four blokes or four women um doing a really fast individual split to create a really fast relay and i think the frustrating thing for all of us at Worlds is that we know that world record's there on that 4 by 2 We were so close to it in Tokyo. We were really close to it again at Worlds. <clears throat> we know it's there. We, you know, we, we, we're right face-to-face -face with it, looking at it, going, we can get you. Would you just let us get you? Um, <laughs> but I think, again, going back to it, that's what gives the hunger. It's what drives us all on. It's what bands us all together, and it, it makes us all hungry we've got that fire in us we want those records um you know i i hope we can get them next year there's no reason why we can't we just all need to be on it on the day um and that is really complicated because you know you can have injuries and illness that can slow people down you can have you know circumstances within the race you know whatever's going on in the race can have a massive impact on on slowing people down or speeding them up um you know you've then got like we spoke about earlier media pressure and things like that you know, I think for me, I'm getting to a point now where I can, I can confidently say I'm doing a really good job of handling that. But I know, having spoken to people, there was a lot of people absolutely categorically expecting us to just demolish that four by two hundred. And mm. you know, I said to people, I was like, "There's th this isn't going to be a walk in the park. The American lads are not going to just mm. let us run away from them. Um, you know, it's it's not going to be somewhat like Tokyo where." there was a big gap between us and second, this will be a much, much closer, much tighter and much harder race. Um, and I think this year, the fundamental goal was make sure we win the race um, because it, mm. it was it was never going to be simple. Um, and those guys were never going to lie down and just go, oh, yeah, yeah, you're good blokes, take, take the win this year. Um, you know, and we'd never expect them to. So I think that was the fundamental goal was make sure that we get the job done to win it. If we get a world record in the process, fantastic. If not, we'll go for it next year. Do you think having the American swim in that fast actually in the future will help you to that world record? Like almost draw your eyes away from the world <laughs> record time and more on the competition. Like the it will race, drive yeah. you guys to a better race, if that makes sense. Quite possibly. Um, it's hard to say because, um, you know, I know that when we get into those races, there's, there's a very specific way we're all going to swim that race. Um, 
And I don't know whether that specific way of swimming the race is necessarily helped or hindered by having to make sure we're keeping an eye on the bloke next to us. Um, I just don't know whether or not it does. But I think in some respects, going back to what we were also talking about earlier, if you can ride on somebody's wave in a 100 or 200 freestyle, it can make a huge difference. If we happen to have that early on in the race for a first couple of swimmers, for example, and we're able to use that to our advantage, that could help us to a world record. Um, but it could also hinder us because we could also then get the first two guys getting stuck sort of thinking, why am I not touching the wall first here? Why aren't we handing over first? Have I had a bad split? Am I, am I not swimming well? Um, you know, so it is really complicated, but I do think fundamentally we've got it in us. We, we are capable of breaking that four by two as a record as a team. Um, it's just going to come down to whether or not we all get the job done, uh, and execute our individual swims on the day. So we'll have to wait and see. Time will tell. Well, the uh, the order was a little bit different compared to what it was in Tokyo. Uh, who decides that? I assume it's British Swimming. And were you all happy with the order? I assume you were. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's that decision is predominantly made by the coaches um, and you know the the British swimming staff. <clears throat> I think we were all very happy and, and content with that that order. I think there's a million and one different ways well there's not actually i don't know the exact numbers but there's a lot of different ways you can swim a relay um in terms of who who you put where um we've all got our own individual strengths um you've also got to factor in how many races people have had going into it because that plays a part in where they're going to be most you know useful within that race um it's it's not an easy job to pick a relay like that but what i do wholeheartedly believe is that the team of lads we've got you can stick us in anywhere you can put any combination of those four people into the race um and we'll get the job done regardless um but i think there there probably is an optimal way um but we just need to continue learning and continue improving and figuring out where everybody sits within that optimal swim yeah 100 percent well, Matt, it's, it's been a very fun chat. I appreciate we've asked you some pretty tough questions here and there. <laughs> now, we uh, we had a fun distance Aussie on. Well, actually, he's going to be next week's episode for those who have got this far in the podcast. Yeah. And he gave us some very early predictions for what he thinks it's going to take to win his events in Paris. And we, we love early predictions on this. So we're not going to ask you, well, no. What times do you think it's going to take to win the 100 and the 200 free come Paris? Because the world of swimming right now is we've had one very, very fast year and then one very, very competitive year. So what do you reckon it's going to take in Paris for you to get that hand on the wall and win gold? Wow, that's a that's a really difficult question. That we're, one. we're not going to hold you to it. No, absolutely. To absolutely. It. Well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not betting you any money on this, but uh, my my initial prediction would be, well, so let's look at it like this. We know for a fact right now, David has been a 46.8 and a 142.9. We know he's done that. Um, so therefore, he is capable of doing that again. So fundamentally, there is somebody that will be in those races who is capable of going sub 47 and sub 143. Does that mean that that will be what it takes to win the race? I don't know, um, because it's very different doing those times at, uh, what did he do at Europeans? It's very different doing it at Europeans yeah. and doing it in an and, Olympic final. Which was a fast um, pull as well, being in Rome. Yeah, Rome. absolutely. And you know that doesn't take anything away from it, because mm. those swims were, were really quick and would be really mm. quick in any pool. Um, however, you know it's more just in terms of will he want to swim those races the way he needed to swim them in Europeans 2021 or 2022 in those races after what, you know, what happened for him this year, trying to chase those times, or is he going to take a more tactical approach and look at it more just from a, how am I going to need to win this? Uh, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell you for a fact, from my perspective, I'm not planning on going 47-4 and 144-3 again. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not my plan. I, I plan on being significantly quicker than that on both of those events. Um, you know, and so I, I can't give you a, a, an absolute number on what I think it'll be, but I, I do think there's a very good chance we could see a sub 47 to win the hundred. Um, and at the very least a 43 mm. mid to low on the, uh, on the 200 mm. to win. I think that's probably, probably a, a relatively conservative, 
Wow, that's conservative going 143 mid. That is, <laughs> that is quick. That is some going. Um, what do you think you will personally be able to achieve? What would you, we've talked about satisfaction a little bit in this podcast, but what would you be content with in Paris? Um, mm. <laughs> that's a tough one as well. Um, from my perspective, I want to continue improving. Um, you know, we won the 4x2 and I won the 200 this year. Um, so the way I'm looking at it is I absolutely want to make sure those both, both of those events are won again. Um, I wasn't happy with the hundred. Um, you know, I, I think I was capable of absolutely being on the podium and I think I was capable of going fast enough to, to be challenging the win on that. Therefore next year, I would like to make sure I get as close to winning that as I can. Uh, likewise, the four by one, we should have won that. Um, and so next year we're all going to want to make sure we get the win on that. Um, and then there's other events, you know, the, the four by one medley, we've historically had some extremely strong teams on that and, you know, time will tell what that team is going to look like in 12 months time, but I'd like to think we'll be challenging for, for medals on that too. And then, you know, as a complete curveball, uh, I don't know whether or not I will just yet, but I'm kind of sat on the fence on whether or not I want to swim a bit of hundred fly this year. Um, you know, I did it a bit short course last season, um, swam it once at the tier pro series in Miami directly after a 53 and thought I was going to die. Um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of keen to, to have a crack at that, um, because that would open up the door then for a hundred fly individual potentially, and potentially then a spot on a four by one mix medley. Um, mm -hmm. so I don't know just yet. And, and that's, that's assuming I can get anywhere near fast enough to, to make the team on that event and who knows. So, um, yeah, in terms of what would I be content with? Who knows? Um, but five golds. Yeah. Well, that that like would it, yeah. be, that would be a good result. I'd be happy with that. <laughs> Rightly. So, um, Matt, we usually finish these questions with some quick fire questions and I, I think we've done them before with you, but it's been two years. So let's, let's fire through them. Things again. have changed. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> what's your favorite event in swimming? Uh, I'd have to say the hundred. Uh, I love the 100 because it's quick, really? but it's also got a bit of tactics to it. Um, and it doesn't hurt for a minute and 40-something seconds. It hurts for 47, <laughs> so I'd probably say the 100. Uh, who is your swimming idol? That would have to be Phelps. Um, you know, growing up for me, he was and always will be the, the goat of swimming. Um, I think the, the term goat gets used a lot nowadays. Um, mm. I feel like it's kind of lost its meaning a little bit, but Phelps is the greatest of all time. Um, and mm. for me growing up, he was, he was who I wanted to be. Mm. Uh, what's your proudest moment in swimming so far? Oh, <laughs> that's a tough one as well. Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I'll probably say the 200 at Worlds just gone. Um, you know, because as you said, um, coming back off the year I just had to turn that around in, in the 12 months that we did and um, be able to stand on the top of the podium individually for the first time and sort of sit back at the end of the meet and go, you know, I, I did win that race. That was that was my gold and forever will be my gold. Um, that's pretty special. Um, so I think right now that would be what, what I'd say, but hopefully in 12 months time, I'll give you a different answer. Mm, nice. Nice. Uh, what's the hardest set you've ever done in training? Oh, <laughs> so actually this, this is a, this is a funny one. I think the hardest set I think I've ever done was the 27th of December, 2021. So it was, uh, Olympic year. Uh, I was in Newcastle for Christmas, um, with Emily's family. And uh, we jumped in the water on the 27th with Ryan up at Newcastle uh, and we did a session with him and I was kind of going in, this is the first time I'd met Ryan, I was going in kind of expecting a pretty chilled 27th of December session as you probably would. <laughs> he gave us, I think it was 2450s uh, all at 200 pace or faster. Um, the first six were off 60, the next six off 55, the next six off 50 and the next six oh. off 45. Um, and he wrote that up on the board and I was sitting there looking at it thinking, right, I've just eaten everything <laughs> for three days straight. I I've just not stopped eating for three days. And I'm looking at that board and I'm like, I do not think I'm going to be able to get this done. <laughs> um, I did, I, I got it all done, you know, through 
uh, probably several tiers actually, but we, we got the set done um, and did a good job of it. But God, that one hurt. And you knew from that moment Ryan was meant to be your future coach. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I think I think when it when it came down to it, when we were discussing options, and I was chatting with Ryan, I was like, well, there's no doubt he, he's not going to let me uh, just flop about, is he? He's gonna he's gonna work me hard. So. I do always uh, find it funny how summers will always know the hardest set they've ever done. Like, you've been swimming for God knows how many years. Like, yep, that's the one, always. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Um, our final question gets to know you a little bit away from a swimming pool. Uh, if you were to go on a road trip, there's three spaces in the car. You can take friends, family, celebrities. Who would you take with you? Oh, that's a tough one. How many spaces did you say? Three. 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 Yeah. Um, we're, al- we're allowed the dog as well, if needs be. Okay, yeah. Well, we haven't got a dog just yet, but I'll take a dog. Anybody's dog. I like dogs. So <laughs> Any dog. <laughs> if anyone's got a dog, they want to come on a road trip, I'll take it. Preferably a golden retriever. Uh, I'd have to take Emily, obviously. Um, she usually does the music for us when we're on road trips. Um, I'd like to be driving as well because I like driving. So preferably be yeah. me in the driver's seat, Emily in the passenger seat. Um, I'd probably then want Michael Jordan. Um I feel like that would be a really, really interesting car journey, chatting to him. Um, and, you know, I think the last spot, I, I think I'd actually, I'd say maybe Ben Francis, the CEO of uh, yeah, Gymshark, yeah. Gymshark and the, the founder yeah. of Gymshark. I think he'd, it'd be fascinating to sit down and, and chat away to him for a little bit. So I think that would probably be my car journey uh, right now. And a dog. I like it. I like it. I like yeah. it. Matt, thank you so much for giving up your time this evening. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Um, and yeah, best of luck for the next 12 months. And can't wait to see what happens in Paris and beyond. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. I'm sure I'll, I'll see you around poolside soon enough. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Well, hopefully we get to hear more sets that Ryan's going to be racing for you, similar to those 2450s. So, uh, yeah, best of luck. 12 months. We've got trials first. Got to concentrate on those first. So best of luck for that. And, uh, yeah, we'll have you on again soon. Thank you very much. Dan, we don't need to review this podcast too much. We don't need to touch upon too many points. But essentially, it was really interesting to understand the mindset behind Matt right now, like the ups and downs he's been through, the hypercritical eye that he's casting over his swims despite success. Um, I know they were quite tough questions we asked him in terms of understanding where his motivation comes from right now. But I think really important to understand that this is the mindset of a champion in our sport right now. This is what is driving him on to future success and not just resting on a world title. Yeah, he looks very much in the zone. Like, um, mm. I was very shocked that he's only had two weeks break. I thought he would have a little bit longer, but he seems, he, I think the word he used was spicy, I think. Yeah. I can't remember if that, if that was recorded or before we went live, but uh, <laughs> but he, he seems ready to, and to go already and he's already done some pace sessions and uh, yeah, so he looks like he's he's ready and raring to go for this very important season that's going to be taking place, uh, well, pretty much now, starting very soon. Um, but yeah, some of the questions we threw at him were, were quite tough, and uh, you've got to remember that he's still only 20, you know, it's, it's mm. still quite young, and he's still, he's very mature for his age, really. But um, yeah, I think he, he stands in good stead. He, there, there are some really difficult questions, I think we asked him about the satisfaction mm. or being content, and uh I'm quite glad, like I said on the on the podcast, that he's speaking about that quite regularly with his team. I think that's quite key because it can be, like I said, quite dangerous if you're uh, if if you're not content with Olympic gold and you think, well, what's what's the next best thing? That 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 is the pinnacle of the sport. So, um, but he knows what he's doing. Well, he knows yeah. what he's doing. So yeah, yeah. Um, I I just I thought it was really insightful. I enjoyed it. Like those tough questions. I think the answers he threw back at us were were justified and I fully agree with kind of the mindset and his justification behind that. Um, Like it was a joy to have him on this podcast. We saw from short course season last year, I think me and you both circled his name Mm -hmm. straight away. I'm just like, look, this is something special is happening since this moved to Millfield. Um, And we saw it at trials and lo and behold, we saw it again on the world stage. And I'd like, he said, he's not now looking to knock off tents off his time he's he's looking to knock off half a second off his times and go way further in paris which is a good place to be in like after the lows that he had he's in a very good place now and it's brilliant to see 
Yeah, it's interesting that uh, he doesn't just want to concentrate on the the hundred and the two hundred freestyle, oh, but maybe fly. even dabble into the hundred fly. I mean, going off what he's going right now, I mean, Jacob and Jimmy have got to keep their wits about them because you never know <laughs> what you can do. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does. Uh, mm. His prediction of well, he could win quite a few medals at Paris, all going well. Obviously, I mean, it's quite difficult to get on a team in the first place. Let's uh, let's Dino, do one Duncan, step. Yeah. Let's get one step at a time first of all. But uh, yeah, he's looking pretty good, as are the, the GB guys as well. Um, so I look forward to seeing what he does. Long may it continue. So mm. that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. Now, on next week's show, if you heard in this podcast, there was a little bit of a tease. We are speaking to Sam Short from Australia. So one of the best distance swimmers in the world right now. So make sure you have subscribed on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify so you don't miss out on that episode. And me and Dan will see you in seven days' time with a very punchy Australian. <laughs> yeah, thank you for listening, everyone, and we will catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.